This program is brought to you by Emory University. To it, right? Let's do it. So, so why do we care about cancer? Right? Why do Why do we care? Why are you sitting in the room? You need credit to graduate, right? No, you, you could take something easier, probably actually, to graduate. Uh, so you're here because cancer affects so many people, right? So the number of cases of cancer doubled between 1975 and 2000, okay? An enormous increase, and we'll talk as we go through the course. Sometimes statistics can be misleading, and we'll talk about why that is right, as, as we go through. Uh, this is going to be a quick overview, but the cases are expected to double again by 2020. So we're talking about a huge number. In 2013, there were almost 15 million new cases worldwide. By 2030, we're expecting 26 million cases and 13 to 17 million deaths. Half, or half as many deaths as new cases. That's why we're studying cancer. Because it kills so many people and affects so many other people. Oncology drug costs in 2014 were over a hundred billion dollars. Right? So it's it's an enormous industry as well, which gets people really upset and gets a lot of conspiracy theorists uh, worked up. Right? Uh, we don't cure it because it makes so much money. Right? Uh, uh, but it it is a it is a huge uh, business. The healthcare cost estimates in tw for 2020 are 158. So huge, almost as big as a lottery or something. Huge, huge number. All right. So many, as we'll see, and we're going to talk about this as we go. Many, and and I would I would venture a guess that if we really did a good job, it would be at least fifty percent of those deaths could be avoided. Just by doing things we already know, not with a new cure, right? Not with a new treatment. Doing things that we already know will reduce our risk for cancer. And we could cut that at least in half. Smoking, tobacco, right? Single greatest uh, cause of cancer. The, the people that are affected by lung cancer, it's more than the next three cancers combined. Everyone thinks, oh, breast cancer. Is such a huge number of people, or prostate cancer, or these other cancers. Lung cancer is more than the next three combined. Right? Almost entirely avoidable by just not smoking. Right? So uh, tobacco products are, are extremely lethal. Obesity, which we'll talk about. What, what's the deal with obesity and cancer? They might not seem like there is a direct link there, but we will connect them during the class. Right? Uh, there is uh, an obesity epidemic uh, globally. Uh, certainly in the U.S., it's extreme. Right? There's a, a, a huge proportion of people being obese uh, or morbidly obese, right? extremely overweight people. And obesity is linked to increased cancer. We can expect that as the population gets fatter, it's going to be uh, more cancer prone. And then viruses. And this is an example of just one of the viruses, hepatitis virus, which causes chronic infections of the liver. Hepato refers to liver. So hepatitis. Itis is inflammation. Right? Hepatitis, inflammation of the liver. This is a, a long-term chronic infection, and as we'll talk about over and over again in the class, the current thinking of the origins, the development of cancer, carcinogenesis, the development of cancer, it is intimately linked to inflammation. So hepatitis virus, which now there are vaccines and cures uh, for some of the hepatitis viruses, is linked to uh, millions of cases of liver cancer. Alcohol, stomach cancer, liver cancer, avoidable thing. Get your HPV vaccine. You will not get cervical cancer, anal cancer, oral cancer. And people think it's just cervical cancer. That's not true. Okay. 
And cancer is a really old problem. People tend to think of the cancer as being a problem of the industrialized age, right? Think of smokestacks and pollution and, oh, cancer is going up and up and up because of that. But it's been around for, for thousands of years. Uh, here we go back, actually, to uh, a but this is the years before 1950, weird calendar, about 4,500 early Bronze Age forager that was found. And this guy was riddled with cancer. Right? Here's a picture of his skull. These are osteolytic. Osteo refers to bone. Lytic is breaking up or splitting. Right? One of the things that cancer does is when it spreads to the bone, it causes a breakdown in the bone. Right? So these are osteolytic or bone-breaking lesions in the skull uh, of this person who lived thousands of years ago. Cancer's been around really long. But let's go back a little further. Dinosaurs got cancer. Right? People have actually done the work to look in the bones, uh, and they say, I, this is my highlighting, of course, it says their tumors were like those of humans, showing that cancer has been around essentially unchanged for a really long time. They look the same regardless of the critter, right? Uh, so, so cancer has been around a really long time, uh, millions and millions of years. There was just a study I saw just the other day that essentially linked the development, the potential to develop cancer with the very origins of multicellular life, right? As soon as there was more than one cell, they weren't on their own, it became a potential problem. So cancer is not a new thing. It's been around for a really, really long time. And, of course, this is what killed them. <laughs> okay. So a brief history of cancer. Right? This is a, a nano history. The oldest descriptions of, of cancer are about 3,000 years old. It's called the Edwin Smith Papyrus. And uh, he didn't write it. He owned it. Uh, and so it was an Egyptian uh, papyrus that, tr that described the treatment of several cases of breast cancer. And what they said was that they used a fire drill. Sounds like a, an awesome medical implement, right? I think it's very descriptive, right? A fire drill. So you heat up something really hot and you poke it into the tumor and hope that you kill it, right? Uh, but really what they said was there was no treatment. So maybe the fire drill thing was just for fun, um, right? But they said there was no real cure, but they tried, right, using, using heated metals and things like that. Hippocrates, uh, the ancient uh, uh, philosopher and physician, he actually named cancer. It's, it's from karkinos, the Greek for crab. And that actually comes from physical descriptions of cancer. So this is a cancer, this is a breast cancer that's been excised from, from a woman. The yellow tissue is fat, breasts are almost all fat. And this white stuff in the middle, right, this is hard. If you, that's why people can feel breast cancer by doing a self-exam, right? It's hard. What happens is that you get a bunch of collagen, a bunch of connective tissue that, that is secreted around and by the cancer cell, and you get a hardening. And this stuff sort of reaches out. Can you see that it goes out like that? Right? And when, when they looked at that, they said, wow, it looks like a crab, right? It's going out. And that's how cancer got its name. Okay. The, what causes cancer has been a mystery for as long as people have been trying to look at it and figure out uh, how to treat it, right? Where does it come from? Well, again, uh, Hippocrates, with influence by the ancient Indian the Ayurvedic medicines, actually uh, came up with what's, what is called the humoral theory. Uh, and in these four humors or fluids that were thought to be in the body, by the way, they don't all exist, right? But these four humors were blood, which does exist, phlegm, which was not the way we call what we call phlegm. They had a different meaning for phlegm, right? It was another fluid. Now we think of phlegm as stuff you cough up, right? That wasn't what they meant. It was just this liquid fluid called phlegm, right? They had yellow bile and black bile, and of course we do have bile, uh, but we don't distinguish yellow and black, right? 
So they had fluids that don't really exist that didn't seem to bother them, that they didn't exist. And they thought that illness in general was due to an imbalance in these fluids, these humors, right? That you could get a cold if there was an imbalance. They thought that you would essentially breathe something in, probably, and that would cause some disturbance and your fluids would be out of balance. Right? And despite the fact that there was really no evidence and no one could even show any of these fluids, or the two of the fluids anyways, it lasted for 1,300 years right? because no one really just asked the question about whether or not it was valid. Right? Hippocrates said it, good enough for him, good enough for us. Right? So there wasn't sort of the scientific method. The, the lymph theory uh, essentially took over. The idea was that fermenting, fermenting lymph cause cancer. So you all know that we have two circulatory systems in our body. The one that gets all the PR is the, circ is the one that carries blood around, arteries and veins. But you have another equally as extensive circulating system. Right? If I was dissolved except for just my lymphatic system, you would see me here just like you do now. Right? Everything is completely covered. The lymphatic system, which captures fluid released from the circulatory system, filters it, and returns it. So they thought there was a problem with that. That lasted until the 1700s uh, and, and is not correct either. Uh, the blastema theory, which was put forward in the 1830s by Johann Muller, he said cancer is made up of cells. Finally, right? Cells. Right? That's a huge plus, right? Big breakthrough for science. Right? Cancer is made up of cells. Uh, but they said that cancer cells don't come from normal cells, but they arise from these Budding elements, these things that they called blastema, that were between cells. Oh, he was so close. Right? Blastema don't exist. There is no such thing. There are no budding elements. Right? In fact, it was his student, Urkow, that you probably have learned about in intro bio, I hope you did, right? who actually said all cells come from pre existing cells. Right? There is his omnicellular e cellular. So that all cells come from existing cells. You, there is no in-between. Right? There are none of these uh, uh, budding elements. Okay. Verkow thought that cancer actually arose by chronic irritation. Uh, and he said that it spread like a liquid. Right? It sort of just diffused. Right? It spread like a liquid. What we're going to find out when we go in further into the class, we're not going to talk about it now, but we're going to spend a lot of time on it, is that chronic irritation, if you rephrase that as inflammation, Burkow was pretty much spot on. Right? Uh, so he, he didn't get it exactly right. Certainly he had no way of knowing any of the molecular underpinnings of any of this, but he, he, he was pretty close, right? pretty close. Uh, he, uh, Carl Thiersch, uh, who worked uh, around the same time, then showed that no, cancer doesn't move like a fluid, right? It doesn't spread like a liquid. It actually moves because the cells move, right? Where the cells go, so does the cancer. And uh, the, the idea that trauma trauma uh, may cause uh, cancer was developed in the 1800s into the 20s, and it lasted for a while despite the fact that there wasn't really much evidence to support it. The only evidence behind the trauma theory is if that trauma leads to chronic inflammation. I'll give you an example. Someone goes to war. They get some shrapnel in their back. Right? Can't take it out because of where it's located. They now have a shrapnel, foreign body in them for the rest of their life. Right? This thing is constantly causing an irritation, right? trauma. That long-term irritation or inflammation is linked to increased cancer. And we'll talk about why that is lots of times. But, okay. Parasites. Uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries into the 1900s, uh, it was thought that parasites may cause cancer. Uh, the Nobel Prize was actually awarded for this in 1926 to this happy-looking guy, Johann Filbiger, right? 
And there was an organism called Spiroptera, Spiroptera carcinoma, which is now ganglionema of neoplasticum, neoplasic, neoplasia, cancer, new growth, right? Carcinoma, cancer. Uh, this organism, it turned out, was living in rats that were in the lab uh, that he ran. And the, the rats were really poorly nourished, so they were really stressed, uh, very sick. And the chronic inflammation, irritation, caused by the infection is almost certainly what led to the increased cancer, right? not the parasite themselves. So later it was shown that these parasites don't cause cancer, but it's probably a byproduct. He wasn't off by a lot. Everyone get it? Right? It wasn't the worms themselves. It was that they were in there and causing long-term inflammation in these animals. That is probably what, what was causing the cancer. And we'll spend some time starting right here with Peyton Rouse. And Peyton Rouse did his work in, in the early 1900s. Uh, he used chicken. This is the chicken. You don't rarely, have, you rarely do you get a picture of the animal. This is it right here. This is the chicken, right? A guy came to him and said, my chicken, my chicken is sick. Help me, help my chicken. I don't know if that's what he said exactly, but something like that. And it was an investigation into this chicken with this tumor, this sarcoma, right? This, this uh, soft tissue tumor that this chicken had is what led into all of the modern understanding of how cancer works and the genes that drive cancer. Okay. And we'll spend some time talking about that. Right? That's sort of where we'll start. So this is something that, uh, is cancer contagious? It's, an, it's a very interesting question. And when the first cancer hospitals were built, actually in France, the first hospital that was dedicated specifically to cancer patients, they actually built it way out in the countryside, way far away from everyone else, because they thought, you know, like malaria and everything else, the plague, right? <laughs> everything else that they had dealt with, that, that cancer was probably contagious, right? And that we should separate these. Uh, and so uh, we're not going to really talk about it in the rest of the course, so I thought it would be fun just to show you a little bit about what we know about contagious cancer, um, because almost all of it is not, right? Uh, but there are exceptions, and I thought uh, it would be fun to, to take a minute to look at them. Uh, so this is the first one. Uh, this is uh, the clonal origin and evolution of a transmissible tumor. This is uh, an es a canine transmissible venereal tumor, CTVT, is the name of this. And this one is, is very interesting. It's, it's a sexually transmitted disease. The animals get it when they mate. And what is transferred is not a virus. It's an actual cancer cell. So the animals transfer cancer cells from one to each other, right? They don't cause cancer in the animal they mate with. They actually give them some cancer cells in the act of mating. And this can be lethal. Uh, it's thought that this cancer has actually been around and growing and living for thousands of years. It's pretty amazing. Right? A life form. It's essentially an independent life form. I mean, it could have its own genus and species, right? I mean, this thing has been around a long time. It's alive, it spreads, right? Uh, and it's uh, exclusively uh, in, in dogs. Uh, this one you, you probably have heard about, right? The one that has affected the Tasmanian devil, uh, the, face, the devil facial tumor disease. Uh, this is another uh, transmissible cancer uh, they get it by fighting. They bite each other, uh, and when they bite each other, they spread this cancer. And it has decimated the population, right? So uh, there was work done in which they were really trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, they tried to vaccinate the animals uh, and, and release them, and then immediately they get run over by cars. Um, and so it's really hard work, but the, the, the populations have been destroyed uh, by this disease. Clams get cancer. Who knew? Right? Who knew? Clams get cancer. And this is actually relatively new. This was, when was this? April. So not, not too long ago. This is actually, you have the clams, 
they're buried in the ground, whatever, they have their siphons up. And if uh, one of these, it's a type of leukemia. So clams don't have white blood cells like we do, but they have a fluid that's called like lymph. And uh, they do have immune cells that are in there. And what happens, and I don't know how this happens in the ocean. Think about the logistics of this. How do you land in another clam? You're in the ocean, <laughs> right? But it releases a cell. This cell floats over and goes into another clam and then will actually uh, cause cancer to develop, leukemia. Right? It's transmitted from clam to clam. And uh, it's just, it, it's to me boggling, right, that this can happen at all. Um, uh, but it's also uh, decimating uh, some commercially important clamming grounds. <laughs> right? So this is something of economic impact, right? Because uh, if they're getting cancer, uh, we're, we're not eating them. And the clams will die. The clams, the clams will die. But they know that this is spreading from one clam to the other because the cells, the leukemia cells, don't match the genotype of the host, right? They're, they all look alike to each other. And humans uh, can, in fact, rarely, there is transmission. It's always uh, essentially mother to offspring. Uh, in this case, a leukemia that was transmitted from a mother to their, to their unborn child. In this case, melanoma. It's actually more common in melanoma than it is in leukemia. And uh, so people do think that uh, if someone has melanoma and they're pregnant, that you really need to be very, very careful about the child. Mel melanoma, as we'll learn later in the class, acts almost like an embryonic cell. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's uh, insidious that way. And you may have to worry about it uh, getting into the infant. How about a transmission uh, between people? Well, here's a case. This, again, is extremely rare. I wouldn't let it dissuade you from going into the medical profession. Uh, but here's a case of a surgeon that actually cut himself when he was operating on someone, and he got that person's cancer in his hand. Um, that would be very, very unusual, because what happens normally if I, put my, if I took some of my cells and I put them into her, what would happen? They get rejected, right? I mean, the immune system, you would say, wait a minute, that's not me, right? And they would kill them. So these cells that were transmitted from the patient to the doctor had to be uh, it, it altered, right, so that they were not expressing the I am someone else protein, right? Which is the technical <laughs> term. If you had any knowledge, you would know that, right? Okay? So they were not expressing class one, class two, essentially. Right? There, there, there were changes. And this actually came out just in November, a couple months ago. So this is a, a really bizarre case. Of, this was an HIV-infected individual, and he was not taking his medication, and he was not compliant. So he was very immunosuppressed. That's what happens if you have HIV and you don't take your medication. Right? So his immune system was really suppressed. He was infected with a parasite that looked like this. This is the business end of the parasite. It just looks scarier, so I put this picture up there. Right? That's the suckers for suckers and the eating part. Right? And uh, he had one of these. It's called a dwarf uh, uh, the nematode, right? this little parasite. And what happens, it seems like the nematode, the worm cells, invaded the guy's body and form tumors in his body. And they don't actually know whether the worm itself had cancer that then left or whether the cells transformed after they were in the human, right? Because we don't know. I have no way of knowing that. But essentially, it's a trans-species cancer case. Right? Uh, and this is the most common uh, uh, type of worm infection in humans this particular one, are very common. So it raises the question is, this guy happened to be very immunosuppressed, very unusual case, but if it happened in him, is it happening in other people, right? And we'll obviously be looking, but this is new. Okay. So, cancer. Uh, first, again, sort of another misconception is that cancer is a disease. It's not a disease. Cancer is a, at least a hundred different diseases. 
Uh, and they each have their own genotype and phenotype and their own natural history. And there's variation between cancers, between patients. So if I have prostate cancer and she has prostate cancer, uh, which is unlikely. Uh, right? But if, if we, if, oh, okay, Kim, right? So if he has prostate cancer, I won't give him prostate cancer, I won't do that. So prostate cancer for us, right? If we both had it, uh, our cases would be different, right? which is why it's so uh, damn hard to treat. Right? And there is tremendous heterogeneity, i.e. variation. Uh, within an individual. So if I were to look at, if I forget the fact that there's two different guys with different prostate cancers, if I just look at my prostate cancer, it's very a mixed bag, right? And that's again, how do you treat it, right? What are you treating? Uh, it's, a, it's a real mixed bag. And so we'll talk about that and how it happens and how you try to deal with it and things like that, but uh, it's, it's definitely a problem. Cancer is, is, is a very big, very broad term. Right. So uh, we find a woman that has breast cancer. So here's a mammogram. Here's a, a tumor uh, in, in the breast, right? Uh, very often what you see when you, when you look at a breast cancer is you see a, a mass of calcium. Why? What do breasts do for a living? They what? They make milk. What's milk have in it? Tons of calcium, right? So what happens is these are cancer cells, but by God, they're breast cells first, right? They were breast cells. And so they still do things like breast cells would do. That is, they can secrete calcium, right? They still will make things like a breast cell. And so you get this deposit, this mass, right, that is, that is visible on an x-ray, right? And that is, that's the calcium deposit, okay? And so the question then would become, when did she get this? And uh, so this, I bring this up to talk to you about sort of expectations and the complexity uh, of cancer. Right? Like what are we going to learn about and why didn't we figure it out yet? Right? We have drones that are this big, right? Why can't we figure out cancer? Right? Uh, so, so what's going on? So here is, here's the problem. Uh, we, we say, all right, we want to determine the number of cells in a one centimeter diameter tumor, uh, and we want to figure out how long it took to get that big. Right? That's our, our real question, is how long did it take? And so we're going to make some assumptions. Uh, we're going to assume that it began as a single abnormal cell. That is a good assumption. Uh, you'll see in your reading, cancer is, is uh, most definitely, almost all of them are clonal. That is, they, they, they arise from a single aberrant cell. So that's reasonable. Uh, we're going to say that they double every 20 hours, right? Which is about how long it takes a, a human cell to double. Uh, that, that's that's fine. That the diameter of the cell is this big, which is like Joe average cell. And then we're going to just uh, make some sort of mathematical things here. And if we do that, and we go through all of the assumption, we find out that a one centimeter tumor, if it were just a ball of cells, would have about 40 million cells. And if we do the math and we say, well, we have 40 million in the tumor. Everyone with me? If we have 40 million in the tumor, how long did it take to get 40 million from one? Right? We can do that math because we know how long it takes for them to divide. And when you do the math, it works out to be around 21 days, three weeks, plus or minus. Let's give it even a month. We're wrong a little, right? Who cares? Ballpark. We're talking a matter of a few weeks to get a one centimeter tumor. And how long would it take that tumor to be the size of a basketball? Who here plays basketball? No one. Okay. You play basketball. How big is a basketball? How many centimeters? Just take a guess. There's about 2.4 centimeters in an inch. Come on, how many inches? How many centimeters across? Yeah. Uh, guess. Doesn't matter. 20. Okay, so if we get one centimeter at 21 days, we go one to two, two to four, four to eight, eight to 16, 16 to 32. So another six days, we have something the size of a basketball. Everybody follow that? Okay, so is this reasonable? Is it a reasonable assumption? 
uh, is it reasonable to think that a tumor that's a centimeter is that a woman is, goes to a mammogram, right? This is my wife. This is my wife. She went for her baseline mammogram. She went for her very first one. They said it didn't look good. Her tumor turned out to be a centimeter at its biggest dimension. Right? So this is super realistic. I'm not making this up. Right? This is real. So does it matter how long it took? I think it does, right? If we're going to try to treat it, we know what it's doing going forward. Is it reasonable to think that it took three weeks? Was she fine a month before the mammogram? If she had gone a month before, would she have had anything on her mammogram? Right? And the answer is no. Right? It's not reasonable. Right? The, the, the working assumption is that to get a one centimeter tumor, breast tumor, which actually typically are slow growing cancers, it would take somewhere between five and seven years. So somewhere between 21 days and seven years is your end. Okay? And that's a pretty big jump, right? So that's what we're going to talk about for the whole rest of the course. Okay? What is it that controls tumors? What is it that allows them to grow? What is it that impedes them? Why does it take seven years and not 21 days? If what you thought of cancer before the class was cancer is what happens when cells just divide like crazy, there's more to it. That's not it. There, there's a lot more to it. So uh, we made a bunch of assumptions. We assumed that there was no cell death, right? Because we never killed anyone. We just said keep making cells. We know cells do die, so that was obviously wrong. We uh, assumed that the tumors were made up entirely of cancer cells. Wrong again, right? In fact, not only are tumors not big balls of cancer cells, which is what you might have thought, I know if I ask my mom, that's what she would say, right? What they are is a bunch of other stuff. Sometimes the cancer cells are even less than 1% of the tumor. Right? All that big blob is other stuff. It's epithelial cells, it's collagen, it's blood vessels, it's other stuff, right? Immune cells. It's not all cancer cells. Uh, and we sort of made the assumption that all tumor cells are created equal. Everybody was dividing, right, every 20 hours. And we now know that that's not the case either. Right? That there are essentially generals and there are soldiers, and some of them are doing a lot of the work, and some of them are not doing much dividing at all. And again, we'll, we'll talk about all these things more. Um, we also assumed in our explicit assumptions that there was a 20 hour growth rate, which would mean that nutrients and oxygen are plentiful. And as we'll see, a lack of nutrients, and in particular, a lack of oxygen, which is called, anyone know? Hypoxia. Yes, great. Hypoxia, right? H-Y, hypoxia. Right? A lack of oxygen is critical for the development, spread, growth, of cancer. So it isn't that nutrients and oxygen are plentiful. They're not. Those cancers make abnormal tissue growth. They, they're not normal. Uh, we also thought there would be no barriers to growth, either physical or immune. That's not the case either. Uh, there are things that slow down tumors and stop them. The immune system, uh, I, I'm assuming that you are familiar with Jimmy Carter and the fact that he was treated with an immune therapy at Emory. Yes? And his tumors are, he has what's called, they said he was cured. Big mistake, Carter Center, right? What they should have said was, he has no evidence of disease. See the difference? It's like a politician difference, right? <laughs> right? He has no evidence of disease. You can't see it, right, at this point. He went from having tumors in his brain, liver, everything, none. Right? And that was the power of the immune system, right? And actually, because these new immune therapies are so powerful, uh, in our cancer panel, patient panel at the end of the class, I have asked some patients who are on those therapies to join us. Um, they're just, they're newly approved, right? But, but we got some who are going to come and they'll talk with us about uh, the, the treatment. Um, but there are barriers. Uh, so <clears throat> now we, we decide that this woman has cancer. And how many of you think you might want to be physicians? A decent number, right? Want to be physicians? Anyone else want to do clinical research? Anyone want to work in a lab, do clinical work, maybe? Right, maybe. Right. So, what do we do? Right now that now that you, you guys are docs, right? We fast forward five years. You're you're physicians. 
budding, right, oncologist. What do we do to her? It turns out that this question is more and more and more complex. Right? It used to be a super straightforward flowchart, <laughs> right? Uh, and it's getting more and more complicated. Do we treat her with surgery and chemotherapy? One centimeter tumor, of course, my wife did have surgery. Uh, uh, it was removed. They offered her chemotherapy. Uh, one centimeter is the cutoff of breast cancer for whether or not you really should consider what's called adjuvant chemotherapy. In other words, it's after the surgery, uh, after you mop up chemotherapy. Or radiation, uh, do, does, should she have hormonal treatments? Some of the treatments are used uh, to treat breast cancer, prostate cancer, some of the others. They're designed to starve the cancer cells or growth cells right, by blocking the hormones that are uh, helping the cells. In the case of breast cancer, it's estrogen. Right? And so there are treatments that block estrogen. Do we do that or do we just wait? Do we just wait? And one of the things that you're going to be doing throughout the course is I'm going to be giving you some lay articles to read, right? not science articles, to kind of show you some insight into this exact question. There's a lot of arguments about it. Right? What do we do? Um, it's not as clear cut as it used to be. Yes? Do you need a wait and watch option? Is, has that ever been affected in terms of like just, because if you have cancer, isn't it like you have to be treated more aggressively? See? That, that you are, you are the population. You are everyone, right? Uh, she says, uh, what, isn't it, what, could you really just watch and wait? Is that an option? Is it not true that if you, if you don't treat the cancer, it will progress, right? That it's going to grow and progress. And, and honestly, if, if you ask almost any patient, if, I, if you went to the doctor today and they were like, yeah, mm, that doesn't look so good, maybe we'll just wait. You'd be like, get it the hell off of this, right? I mean, that is the human, right? That's the visceral response. That's the reaction, right? Cut it off, get it out, get rid of this, right? I don't want this in me. What we're learning, though, is that watch and wait may really well work uh, for, for a growing number of people. Uh, and that is, that is true for breast cancer. Uh, small breast cancer in particular, right now a big, someone has a large invasive cancer, they're going to cut it out. But if someone has a small breast cancer, uh, which we're detecting more and more, why? Because we have better and better technology to find them. So we're finding smaller and smaller tumors, right? Because our detection is getting better and better. What we're learning with breast cancer, with prostate cancer, is that uh, a strategy called watchful waiting, in other words, you're not doing nothing. You're tracking it, right? And if you see a change, then you act. But if the response is, well, get it out, that means you have surgery. And, and there are complications with surgery, right? You can have problems, and you could be deformed, right? You have a lumpectomy, now your breast is deformed. Maybe that gives you sexual side effects, psychosocial, right? You have bad body image. There's a lot of things that go along with this stuff, right, other than the cancer. And so what we're learning is that you really have to take a lot more stuff into account. Right? Still, for large tumors, for aggressive cancers, we're going to cut it out. It's the small ones that we're, 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 our, our, our sensitivity, our ability to detect is getting better and better and better. So we're finding it again. For instance, uh, thyroid cancer. There is now, and I'll give you an article about this. They call it an epidemic. They put it in quotes. Is there an epidemic of thyroid cancer? No, right? It's just that a lot of people have thyroid cancer. It just never progresses or does anything. But if you can find it, right, and then you tell someone you have thyroid cancer, but we're not going to do anything. That won't go over so well, right? I mean, how many people would be happy with that? Okay? Just found out you have thyroid cancer, but yeah, it's all right. Okay? Uh, but it's because now we can detect it so easily. Right? There was a study done years ago in which they looked at people who died of other causes, people who died from car accidents and other things, right? not cancer. And they went and they looked in their thyroids and they found that a huge percentage of them actually had thyroid cancer. So what? Right? It was what's called indolent disease. It wasn't doing anything. Right? It wasn't growing. It wasn't affecting them. It just so happened that it's a really common thing. It's there. But now when we start to detect it in people when they're alive, then people want to do stuff. And then you have to make decisions. It's very interesting. As clinicians, moving forward, you guys that said you want to be clinicians, even not in cancer, if it's diabetes or something else, 
you're going to have to start making very different decisions than your parents or your, you know, parents' parents did, right, as far as commitment. Because it's, it's different than your life, right? The, the, the whole landscape is changing as to what you treat and what you don't. So how is cancer studied? Um, just to sort of tell you what we're going to be talking about in the class, we're going to be talking about a little bit about isolated proteins. Cell line, right? So what is a cell line? When you see the word line, that means it's a clone of cells that is a single cell that has been separated from a bunch of other cells and allowed to grow up in a pure culture. Cell line, right? And then you can just keep growing that forever and ever and ever. The first cell line with cancer was what? Hela, right? Hela. Anyone read the book? Right? The Immortal Life, Henry of Lacks, right? Uh, Hela. Henry of Lacks was a, a cervical cancer uh, a patient and passed away from it. Her cells uh, led to the production of one of the very first cell lines. So cell lines. Animal models are very, very common. It's by far the most common thing that we'll talk about in this class, but animal models have drawbacks. They have caveats. They have limitations. We are not mice. We are not rats. Rats are not people. There's a couple of that. <laughs> right? But uh, what we're talking about here is a different animal, right? Different biology. They live a few years. We live 70, 80 years. They live five years. It's different, right? They eat different food than we do. They have different stressors. So we'll talk about some of the limitations as we go, but it's essentially the best we have, right? And why are we using mice if they're not good? What are we going to do? You're not allowed to do it to your parents, right? So uh, you, it's very, very tough. Humans are, in fact, an, an experimental model, right? Clinical trials are the example of that in which cancer is studied in humans. And of course, uh, we can do epidemiology studies. We can say, well, geez, all the people in India eat tons of curry. They don't get colon cancer. Do you think maybe there's something in curry that stops colon cancer? Now we think maybe there is. Okay? So you can look at population studies, right? Behavioral studies, uh, and, and, and get information. Computer models, of course, as you know, are more and more and more prevalent now in analyzing these enormous data sets, big data, as they call it, right? big data. So it used to be when they first sequenced the first human genome, it took years and years and years and billions of dollars. Now I could grab his uh, pen, get some cells off it, and sequence him for a thousand bucks probably. Right? Uh, so the technology has come huge leaps, right, in 10 years, 15 years. Uh, so now, instead of trying to guess at a gene or a gene or two that someone may have defective when they have cancer, when you have cancer, uh, people will take a specimen, they're going to sequence everything, right? Which means we get enormous amounts of information, which then someone has to try to make sense of. And that's good. We also use computers to design drugs. You know, Emory is actually very good at that, right? You know, uh, probably about Benson Yoda and his work with hepatitis uh, drugs and HIV drugs. Uh, but we do a lot of drug design here uh, using uh, modeling. Okay. The map uh, that's here on the wall, here it is, here it is. Uh, I'll put it up on Blackboard. You might want to print it out, have it laminated, keep it with you at all times. Um, tattooed is good. So it's somewhere where you can see it, because otherwise, you know, it's like, and it would be backwards. Yeah. So, so you want to you want to get it somewhere where you can look at it. And uh, this is uh, from I don't know, maybe 15 years ago. Okay, but it still holds true. So essentially, this is a is laid out like a subway map, and these are some of the main cancer pathways. Uh, these are some of the major tumor suppressors and oncogenes that we're going to talk about. As we go through the course, we'll add to that, we'll draw on that and add on it. This is the subway line. It doesn't have the buses or shuttles or anything, and there's lots of them. Uh, the real map would look more like that, which would be just too expensive to get tattooed. So I thought you might want to do that instead. So we'll just we'll stick with this one. Right? Uh, uh, so this map is, is your guide, okay? Um, the, the central processes that are uh, drive cancer, spread, death, 
development, whatever, can be found here. Right? This is our skeleton, which we will fill out. Does everyone get that? So I'll put it up for you. Uh, and Black, I don't think it's in there now, but I'll, if I don't, just email me, remind me or something, but I'll put it up on, on Blackboard, uh, and you can uh, download that. And that's... The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.